Jared, thank you very much. Uh, you guys can hear me? Mics are on? Not working yet? Yes? Guys in the back? We'll figure it out. Um, first of all, I can't help but uh, observe as we've spent uh, time over the last couple of days and the last couple of years talking about our leaning into the matter of uh, fundraising and resource development with uh, large and mega foundations that it doesn't necessarily come as natural, natural to everybody in this room as evidenced by the fact that you left the seats closest to the foundations empty here <laughs> in the front row. It's one thing to leave them empty in a session just with me, but proximity to the foundations is a desirable move. So for those in the front row, congratulations on your sophistication where that's concerned. Uh, by way of quick introduction, I want to say that uh, as an evolution from our uh, participation with several foundation leaders last year at this same conference. This is the first of three sessions that we will have to have significant interaction with our uh, esteemed guests uh, following this uh, town hall uh, program. Each one of our panelists will spend time with the size of JCC groups, and you'll see them, of course, again at the Innovation Incubator. Part of our intention to create greater interplay uh, and increasing familiarity between uh, the foundation world uh, and the practitioner world of our JCCs. I was very happy to hear the longer introductions that Jared gave to each of our panelists, but I can't resist the temptation to say one word about each of the three as well. Uh, during those three years that Steve Hoffman was on loan from Cleveland to what was then the United Jewish Community, and in keeping with the discussion we had about talent earlier today, Steve took a chance on a guy who was running the Young Judea Youth Movement to offer me an opportunity to come into a significant role in the center of the organized Jewish community without his having provided me with that opportunity. There's not a snowball's chance in Florida that I would be sitting here with you today. Uh, and for that, I will always be incredibly grateful. Uh, Jay and the Marcus Foundation are part of a consistent series of foundations that have been working together uh, to cultivate strategic opportunities and capacity building for some of the foremost Jewish programmatic and organizational uh, development organizations on the landscape uh, and continues to be an advocate for that type of collaborative uh, funding. You should also know that the Marcus Foundation uh, was an important partner in an ethical start, which was a forerunner of the Sheva Early Childhood Learning Center program uh, which now stands on the shoulders of the work that you and the foundation funded. And for that, we remain deeply grateful. Uh, and I had the good fortune to meet Janie, uh, the second generation of the Schultz family with whom I had the privilege of being in contact and found an immediate kindred spirit, not just because she's married to a young Judean whose cheesecake restaurant in Jerusalem was a frequent stop for all of us involved in the young Judea world for years, but because as you were able to glean from the list of organizations in which she has been and continues to be in leadership, she is where much of the creative, dynamic, exciting, free thinking leadership is coming from. And we proudly had her in a leadership development program at AABGU, uh, where she and I and Gabe and a couple of others had a chance to work much more closely together. So uh, it's personal with all of the folks here on the panel and we are very proud and honored uh, that you are here. Uh, and before I pose my first question to you, I should make sure that you're clear about uh, setting the table around uh, language and deliberation that we are having across the field. Innovation is the name of the game in keeping up with the evolving needs, challenges, and opportunities in the Jewish world. It is often believed that innovation uh, is bestowed from on high from some reservoir of wisdom that exists in national or continental organizations. In this field, the innovators are the people in this room. Uh, they and their colleagues represent 160 local enterprises that are perpetually innovating in order to live up to and meet the needs of their local communities. We are increasingly devoted to curating the most innovative things that we do and bringing, some, bringing them to the attention of people like you and your many peers and colleagues in the funding world to help us to scale the best and the brightest that they have created and allow us to uh, uh, bring those opportunities across the entire landscape of the JCC field and the wider Jewish community. We have talked frequently about the fact that our ultimate goal and responsibility is greater Jewish community and greater Jewish life. My first question, and I'll start with you, Janie, is how does your foundation's agenda reflect that commitment to greater Jewish community? Well, thank you for calling me first. <laughs> 
Now, I think that there's two ways to look at greater. Um, one is to expose more people to the Jewish community and the beauty of that community. So a couple of things that we've done, um, um, one I'm hoping we will actually, we will scale in time is we created a program called the Grandparent Circle, which is for uh, non-Jewish grandparents whose grandchildren will likely be raised as Jews to bring them in, so to expand that concept of the greater Jewish community. Um, at the same time, we're trying to invest deeply in our, um, in our Jewish educators. So we've worked with the JCC here and all of our institutions and in partnership with the I Center to um, make sure that all of our educators and lay leaders and informal educators have their own personal relationship with Israel. So those are two ways that we've done it. Terrific. Jay, can I pose the same question to you? Sure. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to understand that each foundation is different depending on the dynamics. So in my case, I'm here representing Bernie Marcus, the founder of Home Depot, and everything that I do comes out of his values and the way he views the world, because he worked hard. He started Home Depot when he was in his 50s, and he's 90 today, and vibrant, and still working hard for the, the Jewish community. We say we don't invest in capital, we do a lot of capital, but at the end of the day for the Jewish community, it's really the people. So you'll see in a lot of our grants, um, they're focused on the people that are in the buildings, um, the professionals and, and what makes the buildings tick. So if, if you look at a lot of our programs um, across the spectrum of Jewish identity in the Jewish community, we've, we've invested a, a lot of resources into talent. And, and later we can talk about why and what that's all about. But it really, if it goes back in time and you look at Home Depot, you see that Home Depot was built by the associates. We're here because of those associates. We don't forget that it's people in the room. I, I, uh, this past year or two, we've been focused a lot on anti-Semitism and anti-Israel and what's happening on campuses and the BDS movement. Um, it's sad that we have to spend that much time on it. We just announced a grant, for example, at GW where we're offering a master's in Israel education because we think that uh, education on Israel uh, needs to be propped up. And instead of a PhD, uh, we thought a master. There, there was no master's program in the United States related to Israel education, but we talk a lot about educating the younger kids out there about it. So, we're, so we, in, we went to GW because it was conducive to our values and our priorities. And, and we formed this master's program that I think we, we announced. So, we, we might be, you know, we talk a lot about going deep. In our case, we probably go wide, um, and sometimes I get frustrated by that, and Bernie does too. But on the other hand, there's so many great opportunities in the Jewish community. And if, you know, I, if you picture the old Ed Sullivan show where there's all the spinning plates and the guy used to run up and down and spin plates, I sometimes <laughs> feel that our foundation is spinning a lot of plates to keep them, keep them going. And we also collaborate. So we look for others that have like-minded projects. And it doesn't have to be our idea. We like to look at other people who have great ideas and invest in them. Terrific. Thank you. Steve, it's fair to say that your entire career was uh, about, has been about greater Jewish communities locally and greater Jewish community as a national mandate. Now that you sit as the chair of one of the great foundations on the continent, how does your view of the role of the foundation dovetail with the work that you've done over so many years? Well, our, our, our thrust uh, has been uh, guided similarly to the way Bernie guides uh, Marcus, more believed in investing in people who can make the changes. And so <clears throat> we've initiated some new programs, some of which are the beneficiaries are sitting here, past and current. Uh, in training for the next uh, group of people who will take your seats. Not too soon, <laughs> but ultimately uh, having a pool of people who can uh, step up and take the work further is important to us. So that's one of our, our major thrusts in the Jewish world. Right now we're focused on uh, federations and Jewish community centers, but it will expand to uh, other areas as well. And of course, we continue to be invested in the Jewish education mission of uh, Jewish community centers. Uh, we're still supporting that and um, more to come uh, of that. And 
The other thing is that uh, we have the same attitude in Israel. Uh, we have a very robust uh, program in Israel, and it's all focused, again, on the training of people who are going to change Israel uh, in the future. We don't actually tell them what they should change. <clears throat> we trust them to uh, deal with the what. We're interested in making them effective leaders in their pursuits of what they have a vision uh, for changing. Terrific. So, Steve, if I had to ask you, is there one initiative in your work with the Mandel Foundation that stands out as the thing you are most proud of, uh, what would you say? Well, it's, it's the training of our people. Um, the, I, if, if Mort was sitting here, he would say the Mandel School for Educational Leadership in Israel where we've now produced about 440 people over the last uh, 22 years who are out there leading uh, uh, new organizations or existing organizations or government ministries, uh, in mostly in education and in the social sector. Um, and wherever you go in Israel today, uh, you have a fair chance of running into one of our graduates. And uh, we feel great about them. And the second thing is that uh, we don't just train people and wish them well. Uh, we maintain a graduate unit which works with the 400 folks after they graduate. So we're now working with people over 20 years, wow. uh, some of them, so they're actually getting ready to retire, some of them, because we get them in midlife. Our, our program trained people who are interested in making midlife career changes into the world of education or social or social leadership. So some of them are beginning, are getting up there to uh, uh, make change. So we've decided to actually try to lower the age of entrance to the program so we can keep them longer <laughs> in the future. But that's our biggest, uh, our biggest uh, uh, and most proud uh, program. And it's remarkable. Janie, I, I would argue that you have been an entrepreneur in terms of philanthropic funding through the Family Foundation. Do you have a favorite? Is there that one thing that you say that's the one that uh, has been the signature achievement of the Families Foundation? Well, I think in terms of our reputation, uh, the one that we're probably best known for is a program that uh, my parents started in Buenos Aires called Baby Help. Yeah which uh, when the economy collapsed in the early 2000s, the, they did a research and discovered that pregnant women and children under the age of four were, had no social network net. And so uh, we helped create a program called Baby Help, which did uh, prenatal counseling as well as offering care for those babies in a daycare setting. And the part that was really uh, innovative about it, in addition to that, um, for all these single moms, because the whole society had sort of fallen apart, so there's an entire new class of single moms, um, is that we, uh, my mom convinced the, uh, the people who were building the new senior home to put that childcare program in the senior home. So they, the babies and the seniors had lunch together every day, and they had shared a playground and things like that. That's what our, our family is best known for. And I think for us locally, because you all operate hyper-locally, uh, what we're best known for is we were the ones who took the, our Center for Jewish Education, our bureau, down to the studs and completely reimagined it and positioned Dallas to a place where um, it's the convener for the community through the lens of Jewish education. And it changed the culture in our city uh, in a way so that organizations who would never work together were working together on common problems, were housed at the J, so we definitely brought people into places where they hadn't been, and so that, that I would answer. I think I met your folks on a visit to Baby Help in Argentina in right? the very early part of my UJC tenure. Mm -hmm. um, there is an expectation or a presumption on the part of those of us who pursue funding uh, from major philanthropists and foundations that we better be successful virtually every time we implement a program with their funding or we will not have the good fortune to come back and see them again for funding in the future. It implies a batting average that is incongruous with the idea of inno innovating through iteration and through trial and er error uh, failure as a, a path to greater achievement. 
Jay, you talked about being uh, broad in the number of things that are being funded. How does the Marcus Foundation view failure as a tool in achievement and greater success and beneficiaries that come to you with great promise and opportunity but don't deliver the expected outcome uh, as, as prospective partners? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. First of all, um, Bernie's an entrepreneur. We like to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial venture. So if you're an entrepreneur, you know that there's going to be a failure. So we, we don't focus on the failure, even though I would say that um, you can learn more from failures than uh, successes often. So over the years, as we've evolved in terms of our, our grant making, um, those, those failures actually have taught us to be better in the future. We often also say that somebody comes with us with an idea, or even when we have an idea, which is how a lot of our work happens, is we make it better as time evolves. So somebody comes with a great idea, Jared's sitting there and laughing because he probably remembers, and, and then you know he comes in, he thinks he has the best idea in the world, and by the time he leaves, it looks a little different, but he meets his objective, and we meet our objective, and we, we make things better. I don't like a batting average. I think that's, a, that's, a, um, that's not the way we like to think about things. Uh, what we do like to think about is unintended consequences. So I'll go back to your question that you, you asked these two great uh, leaders. And so, for example, the Foundation for Jewish Camping was, uh, we were investing in that. Camping is, is a, a big area for us in terms of our investment. And the foundation was struggling, the foundation, the Jewish Camping Foundation when we, in the early years when we worked together. And um, we decided to invest in a uh, training program, the ELE program, the Executive Leadership Institute, because you have camp directors across the country from different camp movements who didn't know each other. And so we decided to do sort of an MBA type year and a half program. You had to apply, we took the very best, we put them in a room. Well, that worked, but that's really not the end of the story. What people don't know is we did three, now four, and we're on our fifth cohort of, of camp directors. But the rest of the story was that we picked the best camp directors out in the country who had waiting lists. And then we invested capital in those camps. So when we started out, we had no idea we, was, we were going to do that. That wasn't even on the radar. But then all of a sudden, we realized we were meeting camp directors and able to tell which ones were doing great jobs. The ones that are doing great jobs who have a waiting list need to be enhanced and helped. So we were able to add 2,000 beds wow. when we started out thinking this was a totally different program. So unintended consequences of grant making are really where the creativity and entrepreneurship comes in. Fascinating. And I should say, because we spoke about it very, with, with great appreciation yesterday, the Adid Nefesh cycle of grants in support of professional mental health capacity in camps is a fantastic initiative of your foundation. And 12 of our JCCs were proud recipients in the first round of grants. So for that, we're grateful as well. Great. Uh, Steve, can I ask a variation on that question to you with regarding uh, to the Mandel Foundation? Are there failures that you look at as great achievements of the foundation because they gave rise to something different? And is there a, are there moments where you literally take pride in the absence of success as a necessary step in the direction of doing better? No, we hate failure. <laughs> <laughs> Mandel, if, if anything, was the epitome of careful planning. <laughs> long, uh, grant requirements are huge, long gestation periods. You could have a kid twice uh, with some of our uh, successful grant uh, applications. Uh, so, but we have failures, and um, and uh, and. We don't, we don't uh, dwell on them. As Jay said, you learn from your failures. And um, in one case, uh, uh, it, was, it was about bad leadership. And, uh, uh, and we didn't pay close enough attention to uh, 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 something at a university. And ultimately, it got closed up. And in some other cases, um, we found that um, there was a misdiagnosis. Now, in that case, the, the one where there was a bad administration, that was a bitter experience, because that meant there was a failure of execution. 
And so when you have a failure, you, uh, you want to analyze whether it was an execution failure or unintended knowledge. Well, execution, not so forgivable. Running into a different situation, okay, that's a learning opportunity. So we were invested um, in a, a training program for a certain element in the Jewish community, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't achieving what we thought it would, and then we realized that part of it was uh, uh, who was being recruited into that particular uh, institution. And they had a recruitment problem. And, um, uh, and, and it was a systemic recruitment problem that we weren't going to be able to fix. So we left. We gave them a parting gift. Uh, we endowed something, but uh, we left. And, uh, and we stayed away from that institution, and we've stayed away from that line of work uh, ever since. Very interesting. I think it's probably widely known in this room that the Mandel Foundation uh, is perhaps the single most supportive foundation in the, certainly in the modern history of JCC Association, uh, that, and that there were both long-standing and continuing levels of support and programs that probably underperformed to a significant degree. And today, the Mandel Executive Leadership Program, while not funneling financial resources directly to us, is providing tremendous resources to us in the form of uh, access and opportunity for rising professionals, uh, several of whom are in the room today. Uh, and again, for that, uh, we are exceedingly grateful. Um, let me shift gears a little bit. The first significant foundation leader that came before a leadership group of the association after I began my tenure was Sandy Carden, who at the time was running the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Foundation. And he came to talk to our board in Houston in January of 2018. Uh, about his perspective on the future of Jewish life on the continent and the possible role of the JCCs and the JCC movement. And he was very gracious about it, but he made sure I knew when we sat down the night before to brief and prepare him for the session. He said, I just want you to know the Schusterman Foundation has no interest in JCCs, and you should have no expectation that there's going to be any outcome of that kind. Uh, and it began a long conversation that he and I had, because I told him I had felt the same way six months before. I also had no interest in JCCs, and I told him why I had become interested in it. Uh, and uh, by the end of the next day, in a conversation with our board, he indicated that the Schusterman Foundation was looking forward to partnering with JCCs, not because of anything I had convinced him of, but because his eyes were opened to the size and scope of the platform that we have, that a lot of funders and others have typically thought is simply a local deal. And in the ways in which philanthropy discovered the potential impact of Hillel and BBYO and Moisha House and others, uh, that the light could be shined on a platform that sees a million and a half people a week through its doors, that has 100,000 kids in camp in the summer, that is the largest employer of full and part-time professionals on the Jewish community landscape, was worth a different kind of a look. Uh, I'm curious if you could give us a little bit of perspective on what you think about when you think about JCCs and when you think about the JCCs as a platform for engagement with Jewish life. Uh, Steve, I'll start with you. Okay, so uh, I uh, am told that uh, we had a pretty successful federation in Cleveland. As you measure, <laughs> as you measure federation, like <laughs> and um, and yet, I felt that there is a limit to what we as federation could reach in terms of penetration. Mark was Mark earlier at lunch, right? who spoke about penetration and stuff. And uh, uh, I had a pretty broad vision of what the Federation's role could be, but it wasn't, it wasn't going to be the one who was going to go out there and touch uh, lots of people. Touch a lot of donors, yeah, a specific kind of touch. But um, if I wanted to reach, as a Jewish communal professional, into the larger community, it had to be through other institutions. and. Uh, there were basically, early in my career, two of those institutions, at least in the, we're a very conservative town, so we don't have a lot of the uh, uh, kind of uh, innovative organizations that you read about in uh, e-philanthropy and stuff. We have synagogues and we have the JCC, uh, basically, and there's nothing else, and the Chabad competing, 
Uh, they're probably the biggest competitor for other stuff. And even they have you know, started going to the synagogue model. In any case, my point is this. I always viewed our Jewish Community Center as our community organizing arm. And um, over different directors and different periods tried to push the JCC to get out more into the community uh, when they were capable of doing so. We encouraged them to open a branch in a, in a certain neighborhood. It turned out it didn't work. I don't know if it was execution or bad time, but we tried it, it didn't work, and now we take a different approach. Uh, but the center was our tool, in my mind, for how we could try to penetrate that part of the community that did not want to walk in only through a synagogue door. And we've encouraged our JCC to, to be that, and you see it through the film festival and the book festival and the camping program and the preschools are all very, very important. Um, I suppose the phys ed program will be important when they can count their exercise in Hebrew or something, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's not bad to see people. We, we believe that the JCC was the place where Amcha could come through a door and be part of the community in, in some fashion. It wasn't necessary to come through the Federation door. I didn't actually care who came into the Federation office. I did care who came into the JCC. Terrific, thank you. And the truth of the matter is, the Mandel name sits above the door of several uh, very important JCCs across the field, as does the Marcus name in Atlanta. So Jay, we know uh, that the Marcus Foundation has viewed the local JCC as a critically important uh, element of Jewish communal life in Atlanta. Could you put a little meat on the bone about that and uh, reflect a little bit on the wider platform of JCCs as an opportunity potentially or a challenge for uh, a foundation like Marcus or other foundations out there? Well, we, we invested years ago in the Marcus JCC, but it was actually part of a community capital campaign. So we, we were, uh, sounds familiar today, we, we're getting a lot of requests and we were, we were so, somewhat overwhelmed, and uh, maybe we played a little bit of a role of a federation at the time in saying, why don't you bundle all of these together, and, and we'll, we'll give 50% of the money, and if the community can come up with the other 50%, we can accomplish a lot in terms of taking care of a lot of the needs in Atlanta. So, um, so that's how it became the Marcus JCC. So we kind of came through it through the, the back door with great enthusiasm. Uh, both the Marcus JCC and Camp Barney Meditz are, we consider to be uh, jewels for, for us in the foundation, especially in recent years. Uh, we had some bumps um, in the past in terms of our relationship. Uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine uh, a few weeks ago uh, who's very big on the JCC and you, and. Um, he kept using the word movement, the JCC movement. And it, it, gave, it actually gave me pause. Um, is the JCC a movement? Uh, was it a movement? And then I started thinking back to the origins of how the JCC started, and we don't need to go into a history lesson here, but I, I would challenge you if you, if you asked me the question nationally, because we did play with you nationally for a while. It, it wasn't the best experience in the world, and it, you, know, it, you ask about risk and failures and successes. That was a really big missed opportunity years ago, the, the PRK program. And, mm -hmm. and when I look back about it, it, the difference that we had with the, with the JCCA and the JCC was more about branding. I think the, the potential for all of you to brand as a group together to, in order to be a movement is, is great. And I, I, I would just suggest uh, when we think about the JCC, I'm not sure we look at it as, as a movement or as a national brand. Uh, Steve Hoffman in Cleveland was one of, is one of the best out there, and Cleveland is one of the best communities in terms of leadership. Um, I'm not sure across the country the JCC brand uh, is reaching its potential. And so for us as a national foundation that looks at national programs, we want your national brand to be s strong. Our struggle often, and this will be the last thing I say about it, is we fund two types of organizations, centralized organizations and decentralized organizations. And for some reason, when I work with centralized organizations, they act like decentralized organizations, and when I work with decentralized organizations, they actually act like they're 
centralized organizations. Um, and I think it's very important you recognize the nuances of both in terms of how you approach the field. And, uh, you know, I can go on for an hour about the differences in how we approach working with those two types of structures. You're a decentralized organization, but you want to be a movement and you want to be a national brand. So the challenge you have and the new opportunities I think you have is how do you create that? I think that's part of this discussion. And I think if you're going to come to foundations like the Marcus Foundation and others out there in the field, um, it's critical that you recognize your local work, but you also recognize that collectively as a group you can be much stronger. And I would just challenge you from your question, and this, this isn't a plan, but I would challenge you that if you're going to get mega dollars down the road, you have to do a better job of branding, and you have to be a better job of defining what this movement's about. There's a, first of all, thank you for that, and there is an ongoing conversation. That wasn't commercial, I no. just, that was my feelings. <laughs> I'm happy, I, I, we are happy, I think, for the comments and the insights, but there's an ongoing conversation about a stock taking that our field needs to undertake to uh, affirm where we are and a shared planning process about where we aspire to be. And it'll be the collective work of going from here to there that defines us as a movement. Just don't hire too many consultants. Can, can I, just want to, I just want to add one thing, though. At the same time that you're doing that, I think the hyper-local nature of so many things plays in. And I believe that the, that the J has the opportunity in every community to be the place where you can say yes to almost anything. And as long as the board is um, prepared and not small-minded, and the board is prepared to communicate that we are going to welcome anybody trying anything, and it may fail and it may not, and we're going to help you try to find funding if it's a good program, and we're going to put boundaries around it so that it's measurable, things like that. I mean, they should be doing all that, to me, the JCC ought to be considering doing all the things that the local community is already doing on their own. So, for example, what, look at where there are or not farmers markets. Look where there are or are not after school activities. Look where there are or are not, you know, all the things that, and it's not even just for the Jewish community anymore, because what we've seen is that um, where the, lots of other people go where the Jews go. And so, yes, we get the Jews in, but we also welcome everybody, and it's also going to have a huge impact, potentially because it's really the only neutral place-based organization in town to um, mitigate a lot of anti-Semitism because it puts a face to who Jews are. Interesting. And I think, you know, what you've said uh, really reflects a lot about what we've talked about here as well. So we, we talk about this billion and a half people that we see every week a million of them from the Jewish community, the only institutional setting in any Jewish community where if you sit in the lobby long enough, you'll see every stripe, style, age, background of the Jewish community coming to the same place, which means the opportunity to touch and engage, and a half million of our friends and neighbors who choose to come to our place uh, for something they could just as easily do somewhere else. But as you were saying, there's something about our doing it and the way we do it and the opportunity to do it in our place that makes this the desirable address. And it allows us to lay claim to being the largest platform for Jewish community relations at a grassroots level exactly. on the Jewish playing field. And so I think the big question that we're all wrestling with locally and continentally amongst ourselves and with partners of all different kinds is, how do we capitalize on the unique opportunity afforded to us by this platform that has no rival at a time when participation rates in almost every other venue have declined and in some cases precipitously in order to use this as a lever for driving greater and stronger Jewish community? And how do we find partners, allies, thinkers, practitioners to help us work through the learning process that we're going to need to fail on our way to success, uh, to find jewels and breakout opportunities, and particularly at a time when you can't paint the folks in this room and their institutions with a broad brush any more than you can paint foundations with a broad brush or Jewish federations with a broad brush, how do we become intelligently prescriptive about the deployment of strategic investment? And I think as I'm gonna invite uh, our esteemed colleagues in the audience uh, to uh, raise questions of their own, 
uh, I would ask you a, a, a brief closing question about how do you find new things to invest in as a philanthropist? Janie. We go where the people are. I find out, I talk to everyone and anybody, anytime, as people who know me know that. Um, and I find out, what are you interested in? What are you going to? What events are you going to? Are you finding them online? All those kinds of things. And when I start to see enough conversation about one particular topic, whether it's intermarried grandparents or whether it's young adult environmental concerns, then we look to, we gather them and we say, okay, what would it look like if we helped you succeed? Steve, same question. How do you find new things? Uh, people are knocking on your door constantly, and it's okay. You know, uh, Moore always said, listen, uh, I was successful. I get it. It's my job to be asked. Um, I don't have to say yes, <laughs> but it's my job to be asked. It's their job to ask, so we're open to um, hearing everybody. We're not afraid to say no thanks. But we are open to it. But we're also asking ourselves uh, internally, where do we want to go? What do we want to do? And we do our own homework into subjects. I'm going to open the floor. Uh, so uh, just to raise your hand, we've got a traveling mic that will come and find you. Um, questions for our esteemed panelists. And don't be shy. And it's a limited time opportunity, uh, at least for today. Hmm. Josh, and I'll ask you to, uh, to introduce yourself when, uh, when the mic reaches you. Just stand so you can be seen and introduce yourself. Hi, guys. Josh Weinstein, Rochester, New York. So I'm intrigued by this idea of philanthropeneurship, which is, you know, philanthropeneurs saying we're going to try and foster seed programs, seed organizations. You guys talked about failure, but there's a big difference between a seed new idea and an idea that's a Series A, Series B, it's already got some revenues behind it. Are you guys having conversations about stages of entrepreneurship of these ideas and how much goes over here and how much goes towards something that maybe already has some traction? Jay, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, don't overanalyze uh, how we do what we do. Uh, it's an art as much as it's a science. <laughs> Bernie didn't have a, uh, a, uh, a business plan when he started Home Depot. I shouldn't say that it's on the tape, but the <laughs> Arthur, would, his partner would disagree, but Bernie didn't. So I, I think you make a mistake sometimes of, not you, but the world of overanalyzing what we do. What we do is we solve problems. And, and we look at both legacy organizations and we look at innovation. I'm not a big fan of the word innovation. Um, as much as I'm not a big fan of legacy organizations that have had a lot of mission drift. So there's a, there's a, there's a compromise in between. So we don't look at, fate, you, know, what, uh, you know, your language is, is strong, I understand it. And I know that we have to be careful not to frustrate all of you out there in the field. We have a responsibility as funders to make sure we're listening to what you're doing and, to, and not to make the mistake of just looking at innovation for the sake of innovation when you already have good people and good organizations out there working on things. So we, we can pick up things in the middle, we can pick up things as seed at the beginning, and we can pick up things that have been going on for a very long time, as long as we're helping solve a problem. What we don't like to do is just fund things because it's out of habit. Habit is not something that, we're, um, that we, at our foundation at least, are comfortable with. Um, we're not into branding ourselves, we're into helping solve problems. So, so we do seed a lot. I mean, in our broader world, over dinner, Bernie came up with the idea of Autism Speaks. I mean, that, that happened over dinner one night in New York with another woman who had a kid who was in third grade who had autism, and he said there needs to be something done about it, and so we seeded Autism Speaks. Uh, we seeded a startup of a veterans organization to put TBI programs across the country because we don't believe in the VA, and we think something needs to be done with post 9-11. On the other hand, Gary Sinise in the veteran space is already doing some great work building smart homes. And so instead of starting something new there, we decided we're going to just go and let him take the lead and we'll be a partner there in that project that he had already gotten started to try to eliminate those 400 uh, double, triple amputees that are out there without, without um, limbs. In the Jewish world, I'll be honest, it's a lot harder. In our portfolio, in the Jewish world, we get a lot of small requests. We, we don't get a lot of mega 
ideas. I mean, we make mega grants because we come up with them ourselves for the most part. But, but at the end of the day for us, one of our frustrations in the Jewish space is that we get a lot of people from a lot of organizations coming to us with a lot of seed programs and a lot of ideas that they say could be big, but at the end of the day, it really isn't that big of, a, of an investment. So the challenge for us is how do we find um, seed ideas that can grow to, to national impact? I'm not sure I answered your question, but I think that I think we don't look at it in terms of those stages. I think you're giving us too much credit. I, so, you know. I think it's a matter of exercise and muscle memory in both directions. We are not in the habit of tr pursuing the grand dreams because we've had less experience perhaps than we'd like of having the fulfillment of dreams of that kind. And as a result, we underplay. And certainly many of us in the fundraising world and, uh, are, look with envy on our academic and healthcare peers in the not-profit world uh, who've enjoyed dramatic investment by Jewish philanthropy and wonder right. why we're, in, we're out of balance with that. But uh, in, in the fundraising world, if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you ask for a little, you don't get a lot. Uh, and I think that's a matter of exercise for us. Let me open up again to the floor. Next question, Lael. Hi. So one Introduce thing yourself first, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Lael Gray. I am at the uh, Addison Penzac JCC in Silicon Valley, formerly in Asheville, North Carolina, where I got to know Mort Mandel quite well. Um, one thing that's on my mind, and I think is on the mind of uh, many others who are actively fundraising, is this question of the next generation of philanthropists. And, you know, just having a relationship with somebody like Mort and now his passing and just you know seeing that there's a generation of um, Jewish funders who had a certain sensibility about the world and how they gave and and so I hear this question asked all the time you know what are we doing about this you know next generation and somebody uh, at my new JCC just said something that I thought was so insightful which was you know we're always you know, hand wringing about the millennials oh the millennials and so she said she thinks, and she is a millennial, and she said she likes to think of her, of her generation as the birthright generation. And the way she described that is that they expect their Jewish life to be free and amazing. And that they should be able to do it however they want to do it, which we talked about earlier. And so, you know, my thinking on that is, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe it should be free and it should be open and all of the things that we're offering, but somebody has to pay for it. So how do we, how are you looking at sustainability of philanthropy in the Jewish world? And how do we start not only developing Jewish professionals, which is extremely important, but how do we develop a sense of responsibility to the Jewish community that would inspire people to want to fund at the same levels that some of these uh, older people have been doing. Thanks, uh, Steve, I'm gonna turn that question to you, please. Uh, look, whatever is, is. Uh, that is, we have to deal with uh, the people we're working, we're living with. And uh, each generation has different experiences, different expectations, whether it's in some older generation can call it entitlement, and the younger generation will say, well, this is what I'm used to. Uh, and, uh, and we as a Jewish people, an organized Jewish community, we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to navigate this. Uh, uh, there are signs of optimism. Uh, uh, if you're in a good federation, uh, uh, then, you, then you've seen the, the benefits of young leadership training uh, and it's not about running the federation, it's about educating another generation of how to be philanthropists and how to think about community responsibility. We see a lot of um, success with that. Uh, leadership in the Jewish community has never been about the masses. It's always been about the elite. Not just the financial, but the people who are saying, I'm gonna make a difference. And every generation is chock full of people who want to make a difference. They're just going to express it uh, uh, differently. Um, we, you know, this whole high tech thing uh, that you're a part of now, they're expressing it differently. Mort Mandel would have never made it in Silicon Valley 
uh, based upon his life experience. Um, he, just, he just couldn't move fast enough. And he thought he moved pretty fast, but he just, he, could, it was, he couldn't do it. He was great in his era of what he understood. And we're gonna, but through the federations and other leadership programs, JCCs, uh, maybe, uh, we, can, we can educate people about how to take responsibility. The money is gonna be made. It's always gonna be made. And it's a question of whether some of the people, not all of them, but enough of the people making the money are going to also be open to being educated to taking responsibility. When they try to take responsibility, they will learn the hard way that they can't write the check big enough themselves, except for Bernie. <laughs> and, and, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, they're going to learn that it takes more in the community than just one rich guy or gal who has a dream. They can see things. They can get things started. But if you want to sustain it, we all have to take responsibility. They'll learn it the hard way, but they're going to learn it. I, think Janie, just, I just want to say, I think you answered your own question because you said they want what they want. So your job is to find out what do they want. Talk to them, convene them, ask them, give them money to try things. That, you know, I think that's really what's going to do it. By the way, I, I just, building, building on that, if they want something, and nobody's giving it to them, then they're gonna go someplace where they can get it. That's right. But eventually they're gonna learn that somebody has to pay for it. They will grow up. <laughs> they will grow up and at some point they will figure out maybe I should pay for it for somebody else. But they're gonna, if, if things aren't paid for, they don't happen. You know, I'm remembering a conversation that I had with another great, very prominent New York philanthropist, Roy Zuckerberg, who was the famous Zuckerberg before Facebook. Uh, and early in my tenure with Ben Gurion University, I was in his office and we were having a conversation about this very thing, the generational shift and who's gonna pick up the mantle. And he said to me, Daron, can you name five Jewish families who have been leading Jewish philanthropists for a century or longer? And I thought for a minute and I said, Rothschild, and he said, one. And the room got silent. And he said, think about it. Wow. There have never been families who have maintained that kind of devoted leadership over the years. And yet in every generation, a new series of funders and wealthy uh, leadership have risen to the occasion. And uh, Jane and I uh, and Gary Jacobs and others were in a meeting last week with three mega foundations, none of which was in business 30 years ago, one of which wasn't in business 10 years ago. And yet, they are among the primary players in the world of organized Jewish philanthropy today. Uh, so the expectation is that, that we're running out of time is a mischaracterization. But the onus is on us, I think, as Steve was pointing out, we need to continue to cultivate commitment to the Jewish community so that when the wealth arrives, they have the seeds of what will ultimately become a major opportunity for them. I'm mindful of the time, and uh, particularly of the fact that I know that you're gonna have in smaller session a chance for far more uh, informal uh, interaction with our panelists. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of our panelists a parting question uh, for this particular session. You have in this room, arguably, a group of senior professionals who bear responsibility for contact with a million people a week across the field. What message do you have for them uh, at the conclusion of this particular conversation regarding the road that lies ahead in our quest for greater Jewish community and greater Jewish life. Uh, and Janie, again, I will start uh, with you, please. Once again, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for devoting your career to all of us and to our benefit, so thank you. We didn't have to do this. Um, I guess what I would say to you is um, be present. You know, it's easy to get caught up in your board stuff and your own leadership and your biggest funders and things like that, but I think actually the people who may be on the, an exercise machine or walking their child into preschool or trying to figure out where to park are the people that'll give you the most insight. Jay? Well, I mean, thank you also for the work that you do, that you've chosen this calling, and I do think it's a calling. 
Um, I, I would stress maybe two, two things, authenticity, um, that when you go to work that you're authentic about what you're doing, um, which ties into the next thing that I would ask maybe of us here, that's sitting here, and all of us together, and that's humility. Um, you know, I hear some language when I do these things that sometimes bother me, and that is none of us are the epicenter of the Jewish people. And so at the end of the day, um, we have to kind of go to 70,000 feet, all of us, and look at everything and be collaborative uh, with everybody. And that takes a lot of humility, and I understand that it takes a lot of self-discipline because you have to pay the bills every day and you have to run your brand and your organization. But at the end of the day, I would suggest that authenticity and humility will lead to great success for your organizations. So. Thank you, Jay. Steve? I'm, um, a, I'm a very practical uh, <laughs> practitioner. Uh, one, I want you to go to two million hmm. Jews through your doors. So you've got to plan how you're going to get there, not be settled with status quo. And to get there, you need to build your teams. You can't do it alone. So you need to spend a decent share of your mind on the team that you surround yourself with and that's deeper in the organization. Because while we're willing to, to uh, help train your potential successors, we can't do it alone. Uh, we're gonna intervene at a very specific time in their career cycle if possible. But it's up to you to develop that pool. Uh, and it, it, it's not an afterthought. So I want you to go to two million, and I want you to build the team that's going to get you there. Fantastic. So you know, Mort uh, Mandel uh, was well known, among other things, for the book that he wrote. Uh, it's all about who. I think a lot of us uh, intuit that what he's writing about is us and the things that we do to immediately surround ourselves with the top people. I actually think that it's all about who is about all the people uh, that occupy the key roles in a JCC. We spent much of the morning on a, uh, the current state of a year-long white paper on talent and the field of the Jewish community centers uh, and moving towards what we expect will be a blueprint for markedly and dramatically changing the landscape of how we source uh, and strengthen talent across a career for the entire field. Uh, it's nice and I think affirming for us to know that we are thinking along the same lines as some of the smartest uh, and most enterprising foundation <laughs> leaders in the continent. We're not the smartest, but we are among the richest. <laughs> <laughs> and the luckiest. Yeah. That's actually good enough for us. <laughs> So let me say that on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Janie, Jay, Steve, we are very honored that you've taken the time to spend much of the day. We look forward to what comes next. Thank you for what you do, and thanks for being with us today.